Good morning, Kumar Jensen. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning, Alicia. It's nice to see you. <laughs> yes, it's wonderful to see you. It's been um, it's been a long time since we saw each other in person, but I've been watching all of the wonderful things that that you're that you've been doing that you've been up to. So I'm happy to, to have you as my guest on Designing Healthy Environments. Good morning, everyone. October 11th, Indigenous Peoples Day. And I am here with Kumar Jensen. My name is Alicia Ponce. I am the founder and principal of AP Monarch. We are architects and sustainability consultants. And Kumar, he is a chief sustainability and resilience officer at the city of Evanston. And so I am excited to speak to you today um, to hear about your role in government and how that is connected to designing healthy environments and just, you know, what you've been up to. But before we do it, I want to share a little bit about what you do, a little bit of your bio. So in your role, you focus on centering people and Evanston's approach to preparing for the impacts of the climate crisis through implementation of Evanston's carbon neutrality plan. I want to talk about that too. Uh, in addition, you serve in multiple leadership capacities within the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, good morning. It's really exciting to be here. It's really nice to see you. As you've said, it's been quite a while, but um, I've been really uh, excited to see that you're hosting these conversations with a variety of different folks, a very diverse set of, uh, it seems like mostly women and women of color um, and people of color. And so I really appreciate you spotlighting uh, people working in the climate sustainability and environmental world um, uh, who are traditionally not highlighted and, um, and their voices aren't shared. So I really appreciate the invite and it's, it's really nice to join you today. Yes, well, I have to say, you know, you are um, pretty popular. You know, I've gotten a <laughs> lot of comments and there's been a lot of, uh, you know, activity on social media and excitement to hear you know, to hear you speak today. So thank you for that. And um, I'm going to start by saying, I, I always like to say, no, like what got people into these roles? You know, mm. what, is, what is it that inspired you or you just, you know, stumbled upon it? Like, why did, why did you go into sustainability and in this role specifically? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I feel like I have both like the personal journey and then sort of what happened as I started to, to do um, like internships and things like that in college. And so I grew up in a, um, a small town in rural Ohio. I grew up on a, um, in a actual hippie commune. Um, and so my wow. parents were uh, very focused on what I sort of consider to be sort of individual environmental um, action. So growing a lot of their own food, um, you know, being very energy conscious, biking most places they could, um, you know, making a lot of their own things like clothes and uh, and so I had a lot of that around me growing up. Um, and so that didn't even really feel like environmentalism. And as, as I was growing up, it just felt like sort of the way in which the community and, and my, my space was operating. And so as I got older and I, I got into high school and um, uh, got into college, I was sort of introduced to um, the systems level thinking and the systems that are you know, impacting our daily lives, um, whether that's healthcare or just thinking about how people get places um, to thinking about how we get our own food. And uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the, one of the things that happened in, um, in college, I went to Earlham College, which is a small school in Indiana, um, was that I started to be really curious about like why decisions are being made and how systems are, are operating the way they are. It, um, and, and so that I turned that attention to government because in, in my undergraduate um, schooling, I had a, service learning scholarship that allowed me to do um, uh, internships every semester for all four years that I was there. Um, and so I started doing internships with, um, I started out at a school doing tutoring and translating work. Um, I then worked at a Latino community organization, um, primarily doing casework. Um, so helping people with doctor's appointments and things like that and um, teaching um, English classes. And then I, I migrated into working for the local government there, working in their planning office and when I was working in that office, you know, it was equal parts fascinating and frustrating to see uh -huh. how, you know, to see like how decisions were made and 
Um, I have some very vivid memories. One was of um, a signage application coming in. Um, and there was someone, uh, there was some, I think it was a, a subway franchise wanted to like build a new sign. And I got to work with the planning director and see how complicated and um, just how many rules were involved in deciding whether or not this one little business, you know, this one little franchise, um, all the hoops they had to jump through. And so I, I sort of decided that I wanted to learn more about the informal and formal systems that uh, make decisions and determine how our, our both our built, but also our social and environmental systems are operate. Um, and it felt like local government was at least the place to start. Uh, and now uh, I've been in my uh, working with the city of Evanston for six years. So maybe it'll be the place that I start and end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, wow. So it, it sounds like it was a natural, you know, natural progression, what you had. And so it, in the fact that you grew up on a farm, you know, it's, it's, you know, second nature to you, right? You know, to be able to be in this space. You just yeah. cannot, you can't ignore what's around, what's happening. Right. Well, I think a lot of the storytelling around individual environmentalism, I think is sometimes really problematic because it, it really focuses on really, you know, shaming people for doing certain things or not doing certain things, like shaming mm -hmm. someone for biking or for not biking to work or not biking to pick up their groceries or not shopping at a farmer's market. And I think what being in a space where those options are readily available, what that did for me is it, A, made that system and those types of opportunities seem like very obvious things that people should have access to, but, but also it helped me recognize this distinction between what an individual can do and how that affects the system versus you know, policy level change. Because my parents, although they were certainly, um, you know, had strong political beliefs, they weren't involved in policy making or trying to change overall systems. And so they weren't really activists in that way. They were mm -hmm. deeply committed to their way of life and that lifestyle. And that is certainly, you know, I've taken on a lot of that, but it, it does feel very different than, you know, what do we do to actually change the systems that have created, um, you know, this exploitive, uh, situation that we're in that has led to this climate crisis. Mm, you know, I never thought of it that way, the way you said, the environmental shame, you know? Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's so much, um, I mean, it's almost a pastime. If you think about the way the environment, the sort of mainstream, you know, conservation focused environmental movement has developed, particularly after the seventies is a lot of the messaging is really focused on what an individual person can do. And it really almost, um, you know, focuses on that rather than saying, you know, we need to focus on what, how our systems are operating. And so for me, I think my schooling and, and those internship experiences, including working at the elementary school and working for um, the Latino Community Center really helped me see this difference in individuality versus, okay, what do we do to change, you know, the situation for a lot of people or for everyone? Um, and that was where it began to feel like, okay, I think I need to learn how policy is created and how it's made, um, because that seems like an important thing to understand, even if I'm, you know, not going to do it for the rest of my life. Yeah, I mean, I always like to emphasize that we do have the tools and resources to be able to, you know, make an impact. And, and there's always innovation. We have to continue to innovate on a daily basis, because things are always changing. You know, take technology, for example, right? It's always changing so we have mm -hmm. to, be able to, to innovate and and to go with it and and you know um there's always learning from our mistakes right nothing runs perfect right and so that's what <laughs> innovation is too is to be able to do trial and error trial and error so i want to learn about your role in government and how you work with designing healthy environments you know it's, it's i think it's an important role Absolutely. So, um, so my so I work for the city of Evanston. So Evanston's a suburb just north of Chicago. It's very dense. It's home to Northwestern. It's located along the lakefront. It has an incredibly deep and strong history of social justice activism, um, and relatively speaking, a fairly uh, I mean a very strong um, and storied history around environmental activism and climate and climate work as well. And so my role for the city is that. Uh, I'm in um, the city manager's office, as it's a city manager or a council manager form of government. So we have a city manager who's appointed by city council. Um, and so I sit in that office 
And my role, um, you know, you said my title earlier, it's a, it's a fancy way of saying sustainability director. Yeah. Um, there are hundreds of other folks who sit in similar roles as mine um, around North America and around the US. Um, and so my role at the moment is really focused on implementing the city's climate action and resilience plan. And so in um, Evanston has a, again, relatively speaking, a fairly long history of climate, uh, climate planning work. Back in 2005, um, the mayor at the time, uh, Mayor Lorraine Morton, signed the US Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement, which established the, um, the, the sort of steps that led to the city's first climate action plan back in 2008. And so Evanston's actually had three climate action plans. So the first in 2008, yeah. the second in 2014, and then this third iteration, which was adopted in 2018. And the first two plans are really focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and addressing energy use and really talking about it from an energy standpoint. And I think that's partially just because that's what the focus of the field was on, but also the experiences and the connections between um, emissions and climate hazards really hadn't begun to accelerate as much as they, they are now. And so this most recent plan um, really focuses both on um, you know, we're continuing to reduce our emissions really, you know, as quickly as we can, but also really working to prepare ourselves for, um, for you know, the climate hazards and, and, and the impacts of the climate crisis. And in Evanston, we have some local data that helps us understand, and it's pretty similar for many communities around the Great Lakes, but we know that our pri the primary climate hazards that we are going to be experiencing mm -hmm. relate to increases in precipitation. And so that's both rain events and snow events and other types of you know freezing freezing rain and and things like that but those types of events are going to be more intense um, we're also going to see a, you know obviously a general warming um, that will happen mostly in the winter um, and in the colder parts of the year and so that will certainly have a an impact on our freeze thaw cycle which is incredibly you know important for buildings but also for you know natural ecosystems and then the other really big one that um, we talk about is uh, our instances of extreme heat. And so I'm sure uh, many folks are hopefully familiar, familiar with the 1995 Chicago heat wave. And one of the things that, I mean, there are lots of um, socioeconomic and societal factors that made that incredibly deadly. But one of the other reasons why that heat wave was deadly is because it was consecutive days of, of high heat and high, a high heat index. And so extreme heat, the way we think about it, um, it's particularly dangerous when it's multiple days back to back and there's no relief for folks. And, and is that what the data is showing that's part of this uh, uh, neutrality plan? Absolutely. So the, the plan is broken into two big pieces. One is focuses on mitigation or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the other focuses on resilience or many people call it adaptation as well. Sort of different, different, uh, different terms, but they sometimes are used interchangeably. And that one really focuses on a a template vulnerability assessment that we had completed as a part of a project with a group called the um, Great Cl the Great Lakes Climate Action Network, which is a group of communities and researchers around the Great Lakes Network um, that, that work to provide both socioeconomic information and data, as well as uh, climatological information for communities. The other thing I just want to mention, which I think is a on a lot of people's minds right now, um, has also been lake levels. And so lake levels mm -hmm. weren't originally part of that, um, that assessment. But what we have seen in, in sort of in some of our conversations with you know, some of the coastal experts like at the uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, you know, what they seem to be saying is um, climate change isn't necessarily gonna lead to overall higher lake levels or overall lower lake levels, but we're likely to see a, um, a wider fluctuation. And so historically, you know, for, for what we know and when we've been around the lake, the lake has shifted by about six feet, right, up and down um, for Lake Michigan. And so what they're saying is you're likely to see that the, um, those shifts and in, in that range um, be wider. And so that could have really significant impacts for both the natural and- At a much fishing. more rapid rate, I, I imagine. I mean, on, in the architectural profession, um, you know, there's that stat that we are building 40 New York cities per month, right? Mm. And so what does that, 
what does that do when you're when you're talking about carbon? What type of buildings are, are we building? You know, whether it's residential, industrial, commercial office, right? And how is that impacting um, the ecosystem, like you mentioned earlier? Because it's all connected. It's all mm -hmm. connected. It's not just that one particular site within the property line, right? right? What happens at a larger scale? You know, if we talk about embodied energy, for example, right? So what does that do? It is a much larger um, just a much larger picture that we need to think about. And do you, um, how does it, how does the, this plan in Evanston address like buildings, for example, you know, in the built environment? Absolutely. So the plan has a, a couple different areas, but the big stats to, to know are that in Evanston, because it's a very dense community that has a lot of, um, you know, it has some pretty strong transit access and, um, uh, you know, high walkability. 80% of Evanston's greenhouse gas emissions come from existing buildings. So it comes from combustion of natural gas in the building or electricity use within the buildings. And so that's obviously, you know, just a, a huge percentage. And so when we think about um, in the plan as it contemplates reducing emissions, but also preparing for things like flooding and, you know, people potentially, um, you know, losing power or things like that, a lot of what it's focusing on is how to uh, address existing building use um, and mm. energy consumption. And so a lot of that has to come through program like retrofit programs, but also incentivizing things like switching from um, natural gas heating and cooking to elect electric options and alternatives. Mm. But one of the things that we want to consider as we think about that um, is also just the ways in which if you're going to go in and do some type of significant retrofit, like changing out from a, a, you know, um, a gas heating system or a furnace uh, to, to an electric heating system or mini splits or something like that, um, you're gonna be doing some substantial work in that building. And so you should be looking at other existing issues in that building, particularly mm -hmm. as we think about uh, and work with affordable housing or low-income housing, um, whether that's naturally occurring or mandated. Um, and so one of our, one of the things that plan does contemplate is that if we're going to be doing retrofit programs in buildings, particularly affordable housing, we want to be going in and also addressing things like mold, um, or if there are, are lead issues, whether it's paint or lead service lines, thinking about what other impacts there are related to particularly indoor air quality and indoor health, because as you change a building's you know, envelope and you change its systems, you're obviously changing the materials that are in there and you know, what may be off-gassing or not, but you're also having the opportunity to do things like improve comfort, right? right. You may be able to seal up drafty windows. You may be able to um, you know, blow in insulation into, into, um, into walls and into ceilings. You may be able to put a you know, um, direct generation or solar and batteries on a building to allow for backup generation um, you know, if there is someone living there that, that may have a critical, you know, um, you know, a critical need related to living with a respirator or having a wheelchair that needs to be charged or all the many different types of things, you know, that could um, be exacerbated in a, you know, in a climate event, like a power outage. How do you educate your constituents, you know, homeowners, business owners to be able to do this and, you know, educate them on what's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. I think what we've tried to do is we've tried to focus on, um, particularly on projects that are coming to us and on existing organizations that are already doing this work or work that's adjacent to it. So when I say adjacent, I mean, if there's an affordable housing developer that's already looking at a property, um, we would try to work with them because we know they're already going to be, um, you know, moving through and uh, doing some significant work on a program. And so we try to work and partner with them. And part of it is just showing them examples, right? So we mm -hmm. don't have, we don't have like a, you know, a building code that um, speaks to all of these pieces yet. Although the, the model codes are mm -hmm. either just released or getting ready to be released here uh, for 2021. Um, and so as we wait for that process to move forward, we certainly are focusing a lot on sharing examples uh, pointing out, um, you know, best practices that we've seen in other, other places. We also do reference rating systems. Um, you know, there's quite a few out there uh, that uh, speak to sort of this interconnection um, of, uh, of issues and aren't just focused on energy consumption. 
right? And so we do, we have uh, in Evanston, we haven't adopted, we have a green building ordinance that was adopted in 2010 and then amended mm -hmm. once or twice. That really just speaks to lead um, uh, from the USGBC. And so what we're hoping to do moving forward is make that more expansive um, so that from a code standpoint, there are either more options for folks um, or there are, you know, there's a standard that really meets our goals. Mm -hmm. Speaking of USGBC, <laughs> you have an upcoming appearance as a, as a panel speaker for Green Build, right? I do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm excited. I'll be joining a couple other representatives from other cities, um, other city staff folks to really talk about um, why equity and, and, and sort of the way I talk about it, why racial equity really matters in sustainability from a local government standpoint. And so um, it'll be a good opportunity and I, for us to talk a little bit about how we frame that in Evanston and what that looks like from a planning standpoint, but also from an implementation standpoint. Um, the, the Climate Action and Resilience Plan has three guiding principles. The first is that all of the policies and actions um, must be uh, equity centered in their, in their development and in their implementation. It also calls for them to be cost effective and affordable um, and for them to be outcome focused. And so we recognize that, you know, there's procedural equity and there's ways in which we need to change the way we engage with community organizations and build relationships um, and build partnerships. But there's also outcomes. We need this work to actually be leading to things like healthier environments, right? And, and, and reduced emissions and um, mm -hmm. helping fortify buildings against things like flooding um, or, you know, addressing lead service lines and, and buildings. And so it's, it's a, I think, centering equity and racial equity in the conversations around climate is long overdue. And I think that our plan um, at least has, has begun that process for it, uh, process for us um, in Evanston. And so we'll be talking about, uh, probably talk about a few examples of projects that we have done in Evanston that we think are changing the way that um, climate and sustainability planning work is done in, in local government. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty incredible. You know, there are some people that wonder why equity matters in um, sustainability or when you're talking about the built environment. And it really is in, I guess, in the mainstream speak, you know, it is now uh, a, a common theme where it really mm -hmm. should have been you know, always a part integral to to lead or to any other of uh, the building certification systems that are out there. Equity is part of what we're doing. Even if like, you know, recognizing today, Indigenous Peoples Day is like recognizing the land where we're building on, right? Mm -hmm. Not just, um, not that everybody does this, but not just look at the profit, right? And that we're going to make or look at how the, this beautiful grocery store is gonna look like, or we're bringing, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. It's like so, equity really should be an integral, core part of why when we build, you know, uh, buildings and start to improve environments. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's there's so many reasons why, you know, racial equity is critical and equity is really important to all aspects of, of you know, of of the change work that people are doing. I think for you know, for climate and sustainability and for buildings in particular, you know, you're not just building, you're not just putting pieces of material together uh, and then having that be used for offices or for a daycare. Um, you know, there are people that are spending, you know, now even more of their time indoors, right? And so those spaces and places need to be healthy. They need to be comfortable. They need to address um, a lot of, you know, the needs that people have um, and the uses that they have. And then to your point earlier about embodied carbon, all of those materials are also coming from somewhere, right? And they're all generated through some type of process, whether it's reuse and deconstruction or you know, the mining of raw materials and, and what goes into that. There's all sorts of levels uh, to thinking about, um, I think equity within the built environment that relates not just to once a building is built, but also how it's built, how the site is designed, whether or not you're allowed to build certain types of buildings in certain places, right? I mean, zoning is historically inc is, is incredibly racist, right? Is in, in, I mean, not entirely, but the, a lot of sort of racial codes were codified through zoning 
zoning codes and, and not as much building codes, although um, you could probably argue that there's been some uh, difference in enforcement of building codes historically in terms of safety standards and things like that in, in parts of cities and communities that are either not as affluent or um, have uh, black indigenous and people of color and immigrant communities living there. And so I think that it's- and It's um, pretty easy to prove because you can just look around and see who's living where and where the industrial toxic <laughs> water absolutely. and the poor air quality is. And you just look at the demographics and say, hmm. <laughs> absolutely, it's a no brain. I mean, it's, it's I think it's, <laughs> It, it may be easy for people to um, ignore the connection or decide not to draw the line, but it's there and it's, it's in some cases, in many cases, it's very obvious, as you say, and it's even written into policies. Yeah, I have a comment here. It says, equity is like air. It may be free, but it's essential for life. And, Absolutely. you know, it's essential for everyone. Right. And I think, you know, the other part, the other way in which I think about sort of the way that equity and sustainability are blended together is they're both a, they're part of what both of them are doing it's not all of what both of them are doing but part of it is trying to understand and dissect systems to understand who they're benefiting and who they're not and how that design is either intentional or unintentional but either way there are lots of externalities and lots of negative consequences of system design and so both of them are looking at that from different lenses albeit but when you bring those together the processes are actually they overlap really well in terms of how you critique or try to understand and make change within them. Yeah, it's funny, like you you say you grew up on a farm, I'm sure with like, you know, quality air and quality water and organic, organic, mm -hmm. meat, right? Didn't you have chickens on your, well, all kinds of animals and- um, Yeah, <clears throat> but we had, there's a, there's an industrial plant um, about a mile away and um, there was lots of concerns about one of the streams that um, had runoff from, from that facility running right through, you know, our backyard. And so they're always, you know, you, you can't get too far away from it, right? I mean, there's, you can choose to ignore it, but and many people can't choose to ignore it. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on the southwest side of Chicago and um, my high school, it, like, and then I ran track, I ran track. And right next to the, the track uh, field was an industrial factory, like, like paints, like, wow. you know, we were in the chemicals as, as we were training for track and, and other schools would come and compete. And we were, we were a really good uh, track and cross country team. And uh, they would, other high schools would say, oh, we're going to the Smelly High School, right? We had like several different um, wow. industrial. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, it, it, and it's a predominantly immigrant community and mm -hmm. it's just like you just wonder why like you know what was it that that people thought this was okay for okay let's let's put a high school here let's put this paint factory here let's put this other factory here and so yeah the, there is history of you know illnesses and, mm -hmm. and asthma and uh, you know plenty of other things but yet another example of just take a look around the demographic and what's there and you know and and, and this is part of your your job right in Evanston is it, just looking at the whole the big picture right and I want to mention like you recently um, posted something about the environmental justice resolution can you talk about that um yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah I appreciate you bringing that up so uh Back in 2014, there was a group of community members who got together um, and approached the city's Office of Sustainability um, with, there, there have been some very longstanding concerns about um, a couple industrial facilities in Evanston. One of them is a waste transfer station located on Church Street um, that is adjacent to, to residential buildings. It's kitty corner from a park. Um, it's down the street a block or two away from a community center and uh, two blocks away from the city's only high school. Um, or only public high school, which is, um, so there's a ton of traffic, there's a ton of kids, there's a you know, ton of people walking, driving, moving, you know, moving around in that space outdoors. And then there's this waste transfer facility that literally is transferring garbage, um, residential and construction and demolition garbage um, in and out um, six days a week. And so 
there, there's tons of diesel fumes, there's traffic, there's all sorts of stuff. And then there's also literal garbage that's being packed and, you know, put into big trucks and moved around. And so there's lots of concerns that people have had for in Evanston for well over a decade. But in 2014, a group of community members came to the city and said, you know what, we want to we want to adopt a policy, we want to get the city to adopt a policy that will address um, and start responding to this type of existing issue, but also prevent this from happening in the future. And so um, they work in a variety of different formats and with a variety of different community organizations um, from 2014, really up until um, the beginning of 2020 to settle on uh, wanting an, uh, a resolution and then an ordinance. And so the resolution was passed by city council um, in September. And what it does is it lay, it a, acknowledges a lot of this historical pain um, that communities of color in Evanston have had to deal with, um, particularly in, in that area, the black community um, and, and, and lower income residents in, in that area. And then the second, you know, the other things that it does is it lays out a pathway forward for, for developing future policies and gaining better information. And so one of those things is to develop a map um, of environmental justice areas. And so that's both looking at um, areas that have already sort of externally been labeled as environmental justice concerns through, you know, places like the EPA, but also then um, having locally derived information. So community members to say, you know what, you know, this area by this, uh, you know, by this factory has been really smelly and we've been concerned, we've seen like, you know, we've been concerned with runoff and things like that. It would incorporate those types of concerns, but it would also include uh, environmental assets. And so environmental justice isn't just the absence of toxicity or the absence of um, some of those negative impacts. It's also the presence of um, amenities and, and healthy living spaces yeah. um, and access to, to community amenities. And so the other piece is that it, it lays out a framework for um, developing a, 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 a community engagement policy, essentially, which would include something like a language access policy, which would acknowledge that historically the city hasn't done a very good job of translating material um, into, I mean, even just one other language, right, like Spanish. But we have lots of different immigrant communities in, in Evanston, and so it's not just Spanish um, that, that, that we need to be translating information into. And so this, this resolution is a huge win for community members, and it's really exciting that the cities acknowledge that and will now be hopefully putting resources um, into developing an ordinance, creating that map, um, and hopefully addressing some of these longer standing concerns community members have had. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, great that the community of Evanston has somebody like you and your and your staff to support them on, on something like this. It's something very important. Um, there, so I wanted to ask you, what does resilience mean to you? You know, this is part of your title, but is that, <laughs> oh, I'm just a sustainability director. But, you know, resilience is, is also something that has popped up in the green building industry, mm -hmm. but very, very integral to what we do. Very important. What does that mean to you? Yeah, well, I, so I have a colleague who worked for the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Her name is Kristen Baja. Um, and she does a lot of the resilience programming for, for the network. And one of the things that, that really, that she says that really resonates with me is that the federal government often talks about resiliency as like being able to bounce back from, um, from a disaster. Um, and her argument is that resilience is actually the, um, the community fabric and the networks that already exist and the, the relationships that already exist and building on those to make sure that communities are strong um, and are well resourced, regardless if there's a, you know, there's a climate hazard taking place. But when that does happen, when there is a shock, you know, like a flood or a pandemic, right? Or a heat wave, um, that community members already have strong social bonds um, and support from institutions like healthcare industry, from, you know, the library, from, from the city to be able to deploy support and bring people together um, and be able to take care of themselves. And so my, I, I take that, um, that sort of revision that, that Kristen, that Baja has come up with. Um, and I think that is a, a much more empowering way to think about resilience because one of the things that it does is I think it places a lot of value on um, cultures within the Evanston community that are already very tight knit and are already very well resourced and collaborative. Uh, I certainly think of immigrant communities in this way, 
in particular, but also I think many, you know, many folks who are in unstable housing or um, are, are lower income, they have to be incredibly creative to be able to, you know, make ends meet. And in, and so in, you know, in some ways, they are already demonstrating the resilience that we need to be able to better resource and build up. It's not that people should stay in that living situation, right? I mean, obviously, someone in a, an unhoused or you know temporarily unhoused situation that's incredibly challenging. But they are already so strong in many ways that what we need to figure out is how to build these networks and support them. It's not so much about the city doing something totally, you know, building some new you know, fancy system that relies on text notifications or, you know, I mean, that's important, but really this is about social fabric and cultural fabric. Um, how does, how do you rate, I mean, this might be a tough question, but <laughs> like, how do you rate your resilience in Evanston, you know, and, and knowing the, uh, like what we've been going through, it's been eight months, you know, mm -hmm. shelter in place and the summer has, you know, gotten us out there a little bit more, but right. eight months since the pandemic has, has been very real. And then we had, you know, protests, you know, because of the, you know, due, due to the Black, Life, Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. And Evanston has been on the news, you know, just as much as like Chicago, right. you know, I, I haven't heard much in other, um, you know, suburbs in the, in the Chicagoland area, except for Evanston. Um, but um, how have you guys been doing there? And, you know, with, with all of this happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I can only speak to some parts of that, uh, certainly, mm -hmm. but yeah. I, I, I will say that, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, Evanston has a really deep and strong history of social justice and, and, and um, you know, racial justice activism uh, throughout the community. And so I, you know, I think in, in some ways this, these multiple crises, right? I mean, the, the sort of galvanizing of pro, you know, protests and political energy after George Floyd was murdered, I think has like really brought a lot of people um, out into, into or back into or newly into this political space of, you know, calling for systems level change and really trying to take back control or take control of, um, you know, the way in which their communities are being supported and where resources are going. I think that's at the that's at the heart of the abolish the police, and defund the police campaigns. Right? Is this this acknowledgement that resources are being spent in a way that some community members, many community members, don't feel is reflective of their of of the values that they hold and so wanting to have more control over that. And I think in some ways that's also what we are, you know, as we think about changing systems from a equity lens or changing systems to respond to climate change, a lot of what we're trying to do is, is think about how we're resourcing things and thinking about what emphasis we're putting on certain things and no longer taking all these systems for granted, but saying, no, we need to look at all of these because they're if they're not designed to specifically support us as the world continues to change, that sort of business as usual scenario is actually, neutrality is actually bad for us, right? It's actually gonna lead to more negative, um, you know, no, more negative impacts. And so I think there's actually a lot of similarity at least in like mindset and approach, even if the goals may be somewhat different in, a, in some of these campaigns, a lot of them are really focusing on taking back some level of authority and control over resources and how that then is reflecting the community needs and the, you know, the future existing shocks that people are experiencing, right? We, yeah. I think one, one final thing I'll say is, I think one key difference is that um, the way that we talk about, you know, climate hazards and things like that is oftentimes forward thinking and thinking about what's gonna happen in the future, whereas, um, the, the, the protests and, and you know, the calls for defunding the police are really acknowledging and focusing on the his, this historical trauma, right? And this, right. The, that's continuing into the present day and, and, and wanting to prevent it in the future, right? And demanding that it be prevented into the future. And so there's certainly significant differences, but I think there are some similarities. Yeah, I mean, me personally, the way I, why I asked this is because I put on my architectural hat and when we're, when we're working on a on a new project and stuff and and the other thing that has surf surfaced is our mental health mm -hmm. right and how all of this has is really testing us and so 
for me uh, as an architect, we always try to, um, I do try to create spaces that bring people joy, that bring people comfort. And, and it really does include everything that we're talking about. You know, it's, it's equity, it's healthy air, it's healthy water, it's comfort. And you wanna come mm -hmm. to a place where you just can, you know, like release and just be yourself and not worry about these things because they are there, right? There they exist, but you want to be in a space because we are indoors 90% of the time. Um, but now we're probably indoors 98% of the time with yeah. winter, with, in our case with winter coming. Um, so we want to feel good. We want to feel good in our, in our places of home and work, wh wherever we are, where we learn, where we heal. And so that's why I asked that question, you know, it's like, how are you guys doing? Because there are other issues that, that we must continue to work on, but when we're not working, where do we rest? Right? Yeah. I think that's, I mean, yeah, it's incredibly important. I think that's a great question where, where do we rest? And I think the other, the other response is like, Lots of people are in different places, right? I mean, I think as a community, Evanston's incredibly diverse, um, mm -hmm. racially, ethnically, culturally, socioeconomically. Um, and so some people, you know, the, the changes that we're seeing have been, have, you know, it's, all, it's changed everyone's lives in a lot of ways, but for many folks, um, they've been in far less control of those changes and it's been really devastating. Um, yeah, there's the there's the age, also the age difference, mm -hmm. like um, so all of all of that, and so it's about in inclusion, right, and making sure that we're we're thinking about all of that. Right, and uh, you know, as climate change accelerates, and you, you know this, not everyone's going to be impacted the same way, right? The systems that are set up are are going to make it easier for some people to be able to respond to things like, you know, having their basement flooded, or, or whether or not that even happens, or what happens if their power goes out? Maybe they have someone that they can go stay with and maybe yeah. they don't, or maybe they can get to the community center where there's a cooling shelter, or maybe they can't. And so there's all these different factors that are both, you know, reveal the fractures in um, the, the social, you know, the social and societal systems as well, and reveal a lot of their strengths, right? There's a lot of strength already there that we need to better acknowledge and support um, and, and learn from them rather than me coming in and saying, well, here's, you know, here's a best practice that we found from, you know, uh, from some community in, on the East Coast, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's good to bring in best practices, but we can't be leading with that. We need to be listening to people. Yeah. So one final question, surprise question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really, I, um, I like to read a lot and uh, I'm wondering, like, what are you, what are you reading or what do you recommend in terms of these, uh, this topic that we're, that we're talking about? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I mean, I tend to, um, I tend to read things that aren't super uh, like technical in terms of like <laughs> building, you know, like <laughs> building code stuff. I mean, I'm doing a lot of building code stuff right now. <laughs> you don't read because, the building code? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm having to this, this time around since we're getting ready for an update. But um, I tend to try to read things that are, help me think about problems differently, right? And so, um, there's, there's one blog that I would mention that I've really appreciated over the years called Fakewitty. Um, Fakewitty? So like, yeah, like fake equity, right? It's like uh -huh. tying, tying those terms together. Okay. Um, and one of the things I like about it is they, they take like a non-paternalistic way, non-judgmental way of uh, talking about particularly buzzwords and these concepts that come up um, a lot of times. And they try to break them down and help people understand Sort of how they can be useful or how they can be limiting because i think oftentimes we hear these new terms like um yeah like equity centered or um you know and it's sort of like well, what does that mean like to some people that just means diversity that's not really what it means or you know they can play mm -hmm. it with anti-racism which they're all related in some ways but um fakeity i think does a really good job of, of sort of taking these things and addressing them as they come up i i also how do you, you spell know. that? F A Q U I T Y? Yep. Okay. Yeah, there's no double E. So, yeah, it's okay. F A Q. -E. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so, that one's really good. And then I, I'm a part of a reading group that's been reading a lot oh, of great books. Oh, I knew uh, it. <laughs> um, and uh, we're getting ready to read a book called Carceral Capitalism by Jackie Wang. Um, and 
I'm really excited about it. It's a series of essays. I, I've had a hard time finding it, but I'm really excited whenever, whenever it does arrive because it talks a lot about the ways in which things like, you know, like parking fees or penalties or things like that, like how all these penalties or how we enforce things, how those actually can lead to sort of over criminalization. And although I don't think it's super applicable, like those examples to the built environment, I do think there are lessons to be learned about penalties versus incentives and how you change behavior and what the outcomes are. And so I think like, again, reading about that is gonna help me think about, okay, if we're trying to get people to reduce their emissions from existing buildings, should we really be penalizing them if they don't have good options? Or should we be trying to find ways to educate, incentivize, you know, and inform them so that they can make the decisions that meet our goals, but also are best for them, right? So that's that's how I'm trying to approach these things is trying to bring, tie these very systems level conversations into, into the day-to-day -day work well. Nice, okay, so we'll be, we'll add those to the list in the comments. Uh, but I want to thank you, Kumar, for your time and for sharing what, you know, the great work that you're doing in Evanston. And, you know, it serves as a model for other, you know, cities to follow. And we look forward to your talk at Greenbuild. It's on November 12th. So you know, go to USGBC and you can, or that Greenbuild, that Greenbuild has a website and you can find this talk, you know, for Wonderful. You to continue to learn more. And well, Next week, we have uh, Sandra Henry. You know, Ooh, Sandra. Excited. of course I know Sandra, yeah. I, I mean, it's, this is going to be good. I'm so excited. So Sandra Henry, for those who don't know, uh, she's the Senior Director, uh, Energy and Sustainability at Elevate Energy. And so we will, you know, continue the conversation and um, it, it'll be good. So tune in. And again, if you, anybody watching, you want to um, recommend somebody to be on the talk, Designing Healthy Environments, please, you know, put it in the comments right there and uh, we will, we will take a look. So signing off again, my name is Alicia Ponce. Uh, uh, founder and principal of AP Monarch. And uh, we wish you all a happy and healthy week. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Alicia. Bye-bye. Adios, hasta pronto. <laughs>